Well, we are in hour nine of Learning the Bible in 24 Hours. And every time I use that title, I'm almost embarrassed. That's an audacious title. You can't learn the whole Bible in 24 hours in, in, in one sense. And yet, in, in a one sense, you can. Because our goal, of course, is to get a grasp of the whole. And once you have a perspective, you always know what questions to ask, and you can dig into the specifics. But this will give you an overview. But this particular hour, we've actually budgeted the entire hour for a single book. It's understandable we use several sessions for Genesis and several for Revelation because they're sort of the bookends that tie it all together. But in general, we go through and take groups of books. But there's, on a couple of occasions in our study, we're going to single out a book to go a little bit deeper uh, because it's so pivotal. And the book of Daniel is one of those books. Very popular book. I would say after Genesis and Revelation, it's probably the, the most popular book to study especially for Gentiles, because it's one of the books of the Old Testament that really includes some very special treasures for everyone, of course, but also specifically uh, for the Gentiles. So we're getting into the book of Daniel, a very colorful book. And uh, I have to say, candidly, one of my favorite books, because there is a verse in this book that caused me, even as a teenager, to be blown away and really uh, discover the reality of who Jesus is, and it was that verse that, I was a Christian, I had accepted Christ, but the, the discovery of the implications of the last four, four verses of Daniel 9 is what really galvanized me to uh, uh, understand the reality that the Bible is true and Jesus Christ really is who He said He is. Well, we'll get there. So, the book of Daniel is 12 chapters and two halves. The first six are historical, that's why we're using it right here in the historical sequence that we're doing. Um, the first six chapters are, are really a history, very colorful history, very interesting uh, anecdotes that take place. The last six chapters are like uh, appendices at the end of the book of the visions that he saw, summaries of uh, a number of very, very important uh, visions. And it'll be uh, important to understand that it's not in chronological order. The first six chapters are chronological, but um, uh, chapters 7, 8, and 9 occur uh, within the other chapters, if you follow me. So uh, we'll, we'll make that clear as we go. But anyway, Book of Daniel, first six, historical, the second six, some really treasures of, of uh, prophecies. So the historical narratives. The first chapter is the deportation. Daniel is a teenager, and he's deported as a slave when Babylon conquers uh, Israel. And uh, the second uh, chapter will be a dream that the king of Babylon has that Daniel interprets, and that leads him to a key position. His rivals contrive against his three friends and himself in chapter 3, the famous fiery furnace thing. And chapter 4 will surprise you. It's a chapter written by a Gentile king. Nebuchadnezzar himself writes chapter 4 personally. Chapter 5 is the fall of the world capital, uh, Babylon. Very colorful chapter. And very significant for us today, because the future of Babylon is very, very critical for uh, any biblically oriented person. And then chapter 6 is the lion's den, which strangely enough I will call the revolt of the Magi. Most people have no idea who the Magi are at Christmas, but we'll get into that a little bit. As we look at the panorama of history that we've been exploring, we're uh, after the monarchy, we've just been through the monarchy. We're, and uh, the monarchy ended with Babylon conquering uh, Jerusalem. So we're now approaching that period of what's called the exile, where they are uh, captives for 70 years. And so, in fact, uh, Babylon conquers. Nebuchadnezzar is uh, uh, the bright young general of the king Nabopolassar, and he ver he's a very successful general, and he's set siege to Jerusalem. And uh, that starts a period of time called the, uh, the captivity, the Babylonian captivity. And uh, he takes captives, sets up a vassal king to, to uh, uh, be subservient to him, takes hostages. The Daniel and his three friends are among those hostages. And uh, Jerusalem then goes and rebels uh, after some years. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar has to set up a second siege. And he replaces that king with a, a, his nephew, uh, Zephaniah. And again, um, they are still captives to Babylon. During this period of time, Jeremiah from Jerusalem 
and Ezekiel from Babylon are saying, don't rebel, because if you rebel again, God will destroy Jerusalem. And they don't, the false prophets convince the king, on a, get him on an ego trip, and, and he goes ahead and rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. And by now, Nebuchadnezzar's had a belly full of this whole situation. He lays a third siege and takes them all captive and destroys the city. So there are two periods of time in the Bible that were predicted to be 70 years. One is called the servitude of the nation. And it starts, of course, with the first siege, when they were made vassals of Babylon. And it goes for exactly 70 years. And uh, finally, when the Persians conquer Babylon, and under Cyrus the Persian, um, that ends the Babylonian captivity. That ends the servitude of the nation, because when, as you'll see, we'll get into it, Cyrus frees them to go home. There's also a period of time called the desolations of Jerusalem, and it's also predicted to be 70 years, and many scholars assume they're both synonymous. It's the servitude of the nation, the desolation of Jerusalem. They're both 70 years, but the desolations of Jerusalem start from the third siege. Second Chronicles takes us up to the end of the servitude, when they finally get to go back home. The book of Ezra that we'll come into in the next session will deal with this what's called the uh, post-exile, after they get back from the exile, back from the captivity. And then, uh, now the desolations of Jerusalem, which starts with the third siege, uh, ends when they're able to finally rebuild the city. And they do that under Nehemiah. And uh, in Nehemiah, by then, is a cupbearer to the king. It's in charge of the area, Persian king. And... Uh, he gets permission to rebuild the city. Not, the temples will, will, is, is the problem. They've gone, gone ahead and uh, worked on that during the days of Ezra. Nehemiah comes along and uh, uh, gets the authority to rebuild the city. The decree of Artaxerxes will turn out to be very important to us as we get into this. And that, starts, that triggers a very, very provocative prophecy in the book of Daniel that we'll look, be looking at. But it's important to understand that the servitude of the nation starts from the first siege, is seven years to the day, to the day, uh, until uh, uh, Cyrus releases them. The desolations of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, was from the third siege. So they're both 70 years to the day, but they're not coterminous. The desolations start with the third siege, and they end with a very particular decree by a Persian king that we'll get into. The book of Esther, which actually in your Bible comes after the book of Nehemiah, will take uh, in, the next, uh, in the next hour, we'll take Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Esther and uh, try to put that in perspective. During the, uh, this whole period of Babylon, we have Daniel as a prophet. Uh, Ezekiel is also a prophet. Daniel gets deported in the first siege. Ezekiel gets deported in the second siege. Um, also, after the Babylonian captivity is over, uh, during the days of Ezra, we have the prophet Haggai, uh, also uh, uh, preaching uh, uh, in parallel to the issues that uh, emerge in Ezra. And in Nehemiah, we have Zechariah and Malachi. With Malachi closing, of course, the, the uh, period that we, either the Old Testament. So that's a, a broad view. A little background to understand what's going on. Nineveh ruled the world in the Assyrian Empire until 612 B.C. when it finally falls to an alliance of both the Babylonians and the Medes. It's a, only a few years later that Pharaoh Necho of Egypt is now emerging as a dominant player because he, he leads an army against the remnants of the Assyrian Empire. During that time, by the way, is when Josiah fights Pharaoh Necho to, re, to try to get his, the Ark of the Covenant back and gets killed. Pharaoh Necho, it, most people don't realize, is Ethiopian, not Egyptian. And uh, that leads to a whole other study I encourage you to look at in terms of the possibility that the Ark of the Covenant is still being protected by the Ethiopians to present to the Messiah when he rules in Zion. But anyway, three years later, there is a famous battle, the Battle of Karshemesh, because by then Nebuchadnezzar, the general of, uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, uh, his son, uh, uh, is, the, is a sharp guy. And he ends up defeating Pharaoh Necho at the Battle of Karshemesh, which makes Babylon the dominant power in the region. This is tip, the typical date used to mark the beginning of the Babylonian uh, Empire. And uh, so that's the background. Now, on his way home, Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem for an additional trophy. During that siege, he discovers that his father has died. He's now the king of Babylon. 
He, he succeeds at the, uh, at the siege, takes, sets up a vassal king, takes Daniel and his three friends, among others, uh, as, as uh, hostages to be educated, they're teenagers, to be educated at court at Babylon to serve at the, in the court of the, of the, of the, the king of Babylon. And uh, so, Daniel, by the way, is the most authenticated book in the Bible. Many people have problems with Daniel. The, it's, there's more archaeological and documentary uh, evidence of Daniel than any other book in the Bible. Um, it has been authenticated by none other than Jesus Christ himself. And we'll look at that before the studies are over. Um, so if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have no problem about the authenticity or the reliability of the book of Daniel. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got bigger problems than the authentic authenticity of Daniel. But His three friends are uh, deported as teenagers in the first of the three sieges by Nebuchadnezzar. And they com in chapter 1, they commit themselves to refrain from the diets and practices of the Babylonians, uh, and they, they want to stay faithful to the way they've been taught, despite the fact that they are in an, in an enforced pagan environment. It's a very interesting thing to study because our children are in an enforced pagan environment. And it's interesting to, to see the contrast and the faithfulness of these young men. And one is named Hananiah, that's his uh, Jewish name, but he's given, all three are given Babylonian names. And due to this popular song about this, everybody knows the Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, Shadrach's name was Hananiah, which means alone by the sun god. Is what it, it's ba they're given Babylonian names in, in, the, in the Babylonians attempt to get, him, get them assimilated into their culture. And Mishael is called Meshach, who is like the moon god, is what it roughly means in Aramaic. Um, Azariah, his name was Abednego. So the Shadrach, Meshach and, Meshach, and Abednego are the Babylonian names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are their Hebrew names. It's interesting that there has been discovered a clay prism in Babylon. It's, now in, it's presently in the Istanbul Museum, which uh, mentions these three guys. Hananuru, the chief of the royal merchants, a variation of Hananiah, and Mushael and Merdek. Merdek was one of the gods they worshipped, and uh, Ardi Nabu. These are, uh, many people believe that these are uh, the pronunciations are very corrupted because of our, our clumsy attempts to transliterate from one language to another. Transliterate is different than translation. Transliterate means to, you try to render it roughly the way it's pronounced. And you'll see some strange ones. But anyway, this is regarded as, as authentic authenticating the three. But anyway, so here we have this young king who's just uh, taken over from his father. His father passed away. This young general is now the king. And he inherits the staff advisors, these cronies that advised his father. And he can't tell whether they're really any good or not. So he's defeated the Pharaoh Necho, so he's taking over the throne on his father's death. But these staff advisors, he, he doesn't know whether they're any good or not. One night, Nebuchadnezzar has a very troubling dream, and he uses the dream as an opportunity. On the one hand, he's troubled, he wants to know what it means. But he also uses it as an opportunity to see if these guys really have any unique skills. So he insists that they interpret it, but he won't tell them what the dream is. And they're upset about that, because if, if, if he'll tell them what the dream is, they'll contrive some kind of ex, you know, explanation. And, uh, but he won't do that. In fact, he believes they're stalling for time. They're not giving an answer one, so off with your heads. In other words, he's, he knew how to reduce head count when it wasn't being produce, productive. So he's really using this as a test, and of course he puts out the word. Now, what obviously happens, if, when you read chapter 2, Daniel... Uh, is in the job category that's been wiped out. Everybody in that job description was, uh, was to be killed. And when Daniel gets the word, when the word comes down, that's what's going to happen. He goes to a supervisor, Arioch, he says, give us a chance at it. And uh, we, we have a God that will help us and so forth. And so uh, Arioch, uh, uh, what, 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 da what Daniel does, he goes to his three buddies and says, boy, we have a prayer meeting tonight, guys. You know, Because tomorrow, off with their heads otherwise. And so uh, anyway, they go to Arioch. Arioch arranges for them to present to the king the results. And chapter 2 is one of the most dramatic chapters in the Bible because you've got these skeptics whose lives are at risk in the back row uh, watching all this. And here's da these three or four young guys. Daniel comes up and he explains to the king what his dream was and he also interprets what it means. So this is not subject conjectures. Daniel will interpret the dream for you. But obviously, Nebuchadnezzar is profoundly impressed, and he elevates Daniel to, 
to, to, to high office. And so, now the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, in his dream, Daniel explains, that um, he saw a metal image, a very tall metal image. The head was of gold, the arms and chest of, was of silver, the uh, belly and thighs of, uh, were of bronze, and the legs were iron, and, and the feet were also iron, iron mixed with clay. And uh, as you will discover, there are four different metals here. The fourth one has a second phase where it has something added to it. We'll get to that when the time comes. And then what happens is a rock, a stone cut without hands, hits it at the base, and that stone grows into a mountain that uh, doesn't only just fill that region, but it fills the entire world. Pretty strange dream. If you had that kind of a dream, you'd probably be pretty troubled too. Well, Daniel goes ahead and explains it. He says, you, king, are this head of gold. And, uh, but you're going to be uh, succeeded by someone else. And uh, what he lays out, what the metal image turns out to be, is a timeline of the great empires. Babylon first, Persia the next, then Greece, and then Rome. But Rome apparently is in two phases, because it's going to break into pieces, and then those pieces are going to recoalesce into a second phase of that, that first empire. So we'll call it for our purposes Rome phase one and Rome phase two. And most scholars recognize that Rome in those two phases are represented by the, the, the iron and the iron mixed with clay. We're going to discover in a subsequent vision the same information that in effect supports this same view. We'll get to that when we get to chapter 7. But what's interesting here is Babylon, of course, rose in 606 B.C., as I mentioned. In 539, the Persians conquer Babylon. And the Persians endure till a young guy by the name of Alexander the Great conquers the Persians in 332 B.C. And uh, Greece continues to about 68 B.C. when this upstart on the Tiber called Rome by then has co conquers the Greeks. And the question is, who conquered the Romans? No one did. Right on. Exactly. Ro Rome fro broke into pieces, and each one of those pieces has had their day in the sun. And uh, the, uh, the Dutch uh, did, the, the uh, Germans twice, the French did, uh, Spain did with the Armada, uh, England with the mistress, as mistress of the seas, and so forth. But none of them quite equally. And what the, the profile is presented is that th these elements are going to recoalesce again into a final version of the original empire. And that will be the last empire on the planet Earth. Because, uh, I should say next to last, because that's the one God intervenes with and sets up His own kingdom. And that's what the mountain, the stone cut without hands, is mess it turns out to be the Messiah. And the mountain that fills the whole earth is God's kingdom that's going to take over. And so we have the whole profile. Now, as most people know, the cradle of civilization was what we call the Fertile Crescent. There was Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon, preceding the time we're talking about here with Daniel. But in Babylon, there was a city called Babylon that you know, then conquered the area. And this is, brings us contemporaneous with Daniel. But after Babylon, of course, will come the Persians. And the Persians not only conquered, but expanded, expanded their holdings substantially. And then this young guy, in a matter of just a few years, conquers the Persians. And uh, Alexander the Great, a very incredible, incredible career. And uh, when he dies, the empire gets divided. Four of his generals divided up. Cassandra takes the far west. Lysimachus takes the, that part that we think of as Anatolia or Turkey. And uh, Seleucus takes the east and Ptolemy the south. The two strongest of the four are Ptolemy and Seleucus. They're the primary players. And they, the dynasties, a half a dozen of their dynasties on both sides, fight with each other. And what's caught right in the middle is guess who? Israel. Now, many people talk about the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament as the silent years. And that's true in a sense, and yet it betrays a lack of understanding of the book of Daniel. Because in Daniel chapter 11, the history from the Old Testament through the New Testament is written down in advance in chapter 11. And we'll discover the so-called silent years are detailed in advance in uh, Daniel 11. Interesting book. And of course, the Roman Empire succeeds all of this and uh, grows to be a, 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 a you know, well-known period of our history. What most people don't realize, many of us that study the Bible or study these things, when we think of the Roman Empire, we think of Western Europe. What we fail to keep uh, aware of 
is that that empire broke into two legs because it got too big to administer. So Diocletian divided it into two legs. And the western leg, the western Europe, breaks apart, falls apart in 476 AD and following. The eastern leg outlasts the western leg by a thousand years. So much so that we give it a different label. We call it the Byzantine Empire. But it's really just the eastern leg of the old Roman Empire. Anyway, so we have a period of the times of the Gentiles. This is a, f- a phrase we find in the book of Luke. Because what Nebuchadnezzar begins, and it will continue until the Antichrist, is the dominion of the planet Earth under Gentile leadership. Uh, the Antichrist, uh, the, this coming world leader, I'll tend to call him, uh, ends this peculiar period of time that are known in the Scripture as the times of Gentiles. Now it's interesting that from Daniel chapter 2 through Daniel chapter 7, the focus of the book is on the Gentile world. And the language of the text changes. The book of Daniel is in Hebrew up to chapter, beginning of chapter 2, and after chapter 7 it's in Hebrew, like most of the Bible. But from 2 to 7 it's in Aramaic, which was the Gentile language of the period. And uh, because that's the focus of it. And Daniel's prophecies are a very rare glimpse of the Gentile world. In general, the Bible always talks about both past history and future history, a prophecy, through the lens of Israel. But we have a gift here, a very unusual gift, because Daniel's prophecies are going to focus on the Gentile world. It's an exception to the Bible. As I say, most of it's different, but from Daniel 2 through Daniel 7, the focus, the center of interest, is the Gentile dominion. And he writes all this down in advance. And uh, now the times of the Gentiles, don't be confused by that phrase, because there's some other similar phrases that are not quite the same thing. The times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar, and they'll they'll end with this coming world leader, uh, who will be displaced, of course, by the Lord Jesus Christ setting up His kingdom, the the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, it's frustrating to have to go through Daniel so quickly because Daniel 2 itself is so dramatic, but we'll keep moving here. As you can imagine, these guys that got upstaged by Daniel and his three friends are looking for an opportunity for revenge. And uh, we get to Daniel chapter 3, and these guys apparently have fanned Nebuchadnezzar's ego, so he issues a very unusual order. He's on an ego trip. So first of all, as part of this ego trip, he builds an image. I assume the image is probably very similar to the one he saw in his dream, except in this case, it's all gold. There's no silver, bronze. It's all gold. In other words, this is sort of his bid for immortality, I, sus- I suspect. And he, he orders when certain music is played that everyone is to bow down and worship his image. And uh, anyone that doesn't is going to get killed. Now I suspect he was prompted to do this by Daniel's rivals because these rivals knew that these faithful Hebrew young men would refuse to do that. And that was their way of getting them executed. And so that's exactly what happens. Nebuchadnezzar puts out the word and uh, these three friends of Daniel's fail to bow down. So he orders them into the fiery furnace. In fact, he's so infuriated. he, He gives them a second chance. If you bow down, everything will be fine. And the three young men tell him, our God is able to save us. And if He isn't, up yours, O King. This is really their attitude. (laughs) So he's so teed off, he orders the furnace turned up seven times its usual heat. In fact, so much so, the guards involved get consumed doing it. But in any case, uh, they throw these three young men in there. But then then Nebuchadnezzar goes to look and he's shocked because he discovers they're not... He says, didn't we throw three guys in there? There's four in there. And it's one of those strange appearances of the Old Testament of apparently the Son of God being with them, with the other three. So there's there's a visitor with them. So he orders them brought out. And the only thing that's been burned on them are the the bindings. They're unharmed. And uh, so now this is a very, very famous event, of course, the fiery furnace event. But many scholars notice something else. So often in the Bible you'll find a narrative, an actual event that happened, detailed, but it also tends to model or foreshadow something larger in the future. We call that a, a, a foreshadowing. A, it's called a type. There's a typological conjecture here. And the typological conjecture would suggest that this image, we know from the book of Revelation there's going to be a final world leader. And he's going to have an image that he's going to force people to worship. 
those I don't worship will be put to death. So we think, gee, there's a, there's a foreshadowing here. And the fact that it's six cubits wide and 60 cubits high is suggested. The 666 is even hinted at here. Well, and that may have some, and, and fire is often used in the scripture as an, uh, as an idiom of judgment. But if that's the case, the question that gets surfaced here is where was Daniel? Where was Daniel? Because he's missing. If, but many people don't notice in chapter 3 this very familiar story, but Daniel's not among them. And um, so there's three possibilities. One possibility is Daniel must have yielded to the king's challenge. He must have bowed to this image. How many think so? Absolutely not. Absolutely. You're right. The other thing is maybe somehow Daniel was exempted from the accusation by his enemies. Somehow I don't think that's true either. The third possibility is the reasonable conjecture, and that's that Daniel was removed from the situation somehow. I suspect that he was, a, since he was so senior for the king, he was like virtually prime minister, that he was sent on some errand for the king, some foreign assignment to go do, he's on some kind of a trip. And that's what his enemies took advantage of to try to get his three buddies executed. The point is that Daniel, it doesn't tell, explain why, but Daniel's not, not in this situation. And so many people that uh, make a point of that, that it's kind of interesting that there's apparently a privileged believer removed before the judgment. And so that, that you could, I wouldn't make doctrine from that, but I think it's interesting to observe. Well, chapter 4 is a surprising chapter because Nebuchadnezzar writes the chapter himself. He writes it and has it posted throughout the entire world that he controls. He ends up having a second dream in which there was a great tree that was hewn down. After, I'll give you a brief version of it. It was cut down after seven years. And Daniel interprets the dream to him. That the dream, he's the dream, he's the, he's the, he's the guy. And uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's on, on the ramparts of Babylon and taking pride. Look what I have done. He's on a big ego trip. And that's exactly what the dream was anticipating. Because of pride, he would have a seven year, um, seven years in the penalty box, so to speak. And a year later, he's again on this uh, parapet bragging about how, what a great king he, he, he thinks he is. And uh, he's stricken with a mental derangement, a form of lycanthropy, the, where he is literally eating grass. And he's, he, he, the, uh, according to the uh, uh, Hebrew records, uh, a, a Talmud, I think it is, the, um, Daniel uh, was his nurse during those seven years. At the end of the seven years, he's cured of that, but he also recognizes and acknowledges that it was a fulfillment of the dream that he had himself a year earlier. And so he writes the chapter. He recovers and he publishes his personal testimony throughout the entire world. And I personally, from reading chapter 4, will not be surprised when in heaven if I run into Nebuchadnezzar. I think he's a saved person, interestingly enough. He had a very intimate relationship with his, his friend Daniel. They were very close, apparently. But anyway, the reason he's so prideful, you need to have a little perspective of Babylon. The city of Babylon, of course, was fed by the Euphrates. It straddled the Euphrates virtually. And uh, the... Uh, and it had a double wall system. If you look at just the Babylon proper, it has, not only, it has a, a double wall and a moat, and uh, they had uh, uh, 250 watchtowers, 100 feet higher than the wall itself, and uh, the, uh, the bank, there's a banquet hall involved. I'll show you where some of this stuff is. That's the town itself. There's a processional way up at the top, and there's the Tower of Babel that's featured in Genesis 11. Uh, the Temple of Marduk and so forth. The king's palace is going to be the scene of our, the events in chapter 5. And that building has been rebuilt. Saddam Hussein has even uh, used it for affairs of state. But uh, notice how the, the river Euphrates goes through the city to provide it water in case of a siege, but it also that water feeds the moat that protects the city. And uh, the wall was no trivial wall. They had chariot races four to six abreast on top of the wall. So it's a, this is a, and it's, you're talking a, you know 15 mile uh, 15 miles on a side. So this is a sizable uh, pl uh, place, and it was considered impregnable, and therein uh, lies their vulnerability, that, that belief. Now the kings of the Babylonian Empire, after Nebuchadnezzar, of course, had Nebuchadnezzar as his son that uh, established the kingdom, and he has um, uh, uh, two sons and uh, two daughters. And his first son takes over for a bit, but he's a, he's a bad apple. His other daughter married, but uh, Neri Glasser uh, has a, he, he takes over, and his son, I think, lasts two months. And then finally, uh, Nabonidus takes over. And he has his son, Belshazzar, as a co regent. We'll discover that Nabonidus was just, he, he had married uh, one of the, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. Uh, he, uh, 
is just not interested in Babylon. He's off in foreign intrigues uh, down in Arabia and doing other things. In fact, he had not been in town for 14 years when it finally falls. And that's worth understanding because there's a huge discrepancy. The secular world had all kinds of evidence that, that uh, Nabonidus was really the king of Babylon when it fell. And that's why the Bible couldn't be correct. Well, they discovered more recently things that point out that Belshazzar, his son, was reigning at the time exactly the way Daniel says. So not only do we know that Daniel wrote, that, that, was, that, that chapter 5 was correct, it had to be by an eyewitness, we know now. But, but Daniel 5 is the fall of Babylon. Very, very colorful uh, per, uh, uh, amount of history here. Uh, instead of the, the Persian armies on the horizon, instead of defending the city, he throws a party for a thousand of his nobles. And a uh, big mistake. The Persian army is, is formidable and been on the uprise here. But they're having this big party, and, and Belshazzar does a dumb thing. He sends across the street to the museum to bring out the implements that his grandfather had taken from the temple 70 years earlier and going to use them as party implements. Well, that's just guaranteed to anger God even further. So what the party is doing great until they see the fingers of a man's hand writing on the wall. And of course, it's, you know, it's astonishing to realize how many expressions in our common day language come from Daniel. <laughs> he saw the handwriting on the wall. You've all used that expression. There's numbers up. You know? you, you're weighed and found wanting. Right? The idol has clay feet. You see, all these expressions are from uh, the, uh, the book of Daniel, interestingly enough. The experts there can't understand what's being written. They can't decipher it, which is a surprise. But the queen mother... Nebuchadnezzar's widow is still alive, and she says to her grandson, there was a guy around in your grandfather's day. You understand they don't have any word for grandfather in Aramaic or Hebrew, so when they say father, that, could, that just means a forebear. So. But anyway, she says there was a guy around in your grandfather's day that had, this, had the gift to do that. So they bring Daniel out of retirement, and he comes in. They offer him all kinds of rewards. He says, you keep your rewards. Before he gives them the answer he wants, he gives an eulogy for Nebuchadnezzar. He says, now there, your grandfather, there was a king. Because who he would set, who, who, whom he would set up, he set up, and who he'd bring down, he'd bring down. Not like you, Squirt. That's virtually his, the phrase of his, his discussion. But then after all that, he goes ahead and interprets the famous event. And uh, what, he didn't, what no one knew in the banquet hall, while this was all going on, the Persian army had arranged to divert the Euphrates upriver so the water level went down, and they slipped in under the gates. They took over Babylon without a battle. And that's going to be important later, but this is going on while the party is going on here. Now, one of the questions that people ask, are there really hidden codes in the Bible? I get that question a lot because of our, our doctoral work and some other materials we have. And it's in the Bible. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, and the honor or duty of kings to search out a matter. They're definite. The Bible is full of surprises tucked away underneath the text. There's a form of Hebrew encryption that's well known to anybody that's been a student of cryptography. We take the Hebrew alphabet, the, 11, the 22 letters, take the first 11 and put the second 11 underneath it, so to speak, and then transpose. If you want an aleph, you use a lamed and so forth. And that's a simple form of transposition. And it's, it's named after the first three letters. Instead of aleph, you have a lambda. Instead of a bet, you have a, a, a mem. So, it's, it's equivalent to ALBM, uh, album, is, is, the, is the label given to this form of encryption. If you take the second half of the alphabet and put it in backwards, now we take the letters and put the others in there backwards, that's, you get a different set of transpositions. And again, you have an aleph and a ta and a, and a bet and a shin, and so it's, uh, it's, at, it's called atbash. According to the Talmud, the belief in the, among the Hebrew scholars is that the encryption that was used in the hydrating of the wall was a form of atbash, which means the handwriting of the wall, assuming it was atbash, would have said something like this, except it would be Aramaic letters rather than the, these letters that they use today. And using the atbash encryption and transposing, you get what Daniel ended up reading to them. Remember that all languages go towards Jerusalem. In other words, all, all everybody east of Jerusalem goes from right to left. Hebrew, Aramaic, Sanskrit, etc., etc., etc. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. English, Latin, Russian, Greek, uh, you name it. So anyway, so remember Hebrew goes backwards from our point of view. Anyway, so Daniel says many, many. That means that the word means, by the way, the, the Hebrew only uses consonants. The vowels are inferred. 
That's a way of bandwidth reduction and so forth, but I won't get into all that here. Um, many, many means, it means numbered or reckoned. And he interprets it. He says, God hath numbered your kingdom and finished it. The way we would abbreviate that is your number's up. Okay? Next word was tekel, which is, uh, uh, means weighed. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting, Daniel explains. And uh, the third word is uh, peres, which means broken or divided. It says, Thy kingdom is div divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And by the way, in your King James, it say you farsen. The you is simply a conjunction. The farsen is the plural of Paris, but don't worry about that uh, in the transliteration. If you infer a different vowel than the e, say an a, a paras, is the word for Persians. So there's a pun hidden in here also that's not brought up in your normal uh, translations. But in any case, this, of course, is what Daniel announces. And uh, that night, of course, Belshazzar is slain, and the, per and the Persians take over the city. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next session because we'll get to Ezra and I'll use that occasion to explain what Cyrus did when Cyrus makes his grand entrance and that's a, that's a great scene, but we'll hold that for the next session. In uh, Daniel 6, by now Daniel's about 83 years old, and one of the interesting things about Daniel's career is that he rises to power in the Second Empire. In other words, he was the number two man, so to speak, or you know, high, he was high up under Nebuchadnezzar. He rose because he interpreted Daniel 2. He was given great privileges and responsibilities under Nebuchadnezzar. When the Persians take over the Babylonians, he again rises to uh, power. To, he was, he's the number three ruler in the kingdom, and uh, very prominent, even though he's 83. And uh, in fact, he is appointed Rab Mag, the chief of the Magi. You need to understand the Magi for lots of reasons. The Magi were a hereditary priesthood that had the power to appoint the king. In other words, they were a priestly sect, it was religious, and yet it was also administrative. That's where we get the word magistrate from that word, Magi. And, uh, the, but they were hereditary. They were Medes. In the combined empire, the Medes and the Persians, the Medes had the, the, that particular role. Daniel is appointed the Rab Mag, the head of that priesthood. Now, how do you think it went over for these Medes to be now reporting to a Jew? They were not excited about the prospect, apparently, because they're the ones, I believe, that engineered this uh, uh, execu attempted execution of Daniel. And uh, so the jealous rivals entrapped him into the lion's den. The king of the Persians they had a strange law in, among them in, in Persia that the king could write a law, but he could not change it once it's written. We find that operative here in Daniel 6. You'll also, it's essential to understand for the book of Esther that we'll come to later, next session. But uh, in any case, uh, the king is tricked into signing this document, and Dan if anyone's found praying to, to the wrong god, he gets to the lion's den. Of course, Daniel is very faithful, and he is praying. And uh, so he gets into this lion's den. You all know the story. It's interesting that the king himself was upset, but he couldn't change it. And that next morning he rushes there to see if Daniel's okay. He, he cares about Daniel. You see it all through this. And Daniel, of course, is miraculously spared. But something that is implied by this and some other writings is that Daniel apparently was entrusted some prophecies that he, that, uh, that to, that he, he received some prophecies that he entrusted to a cabal, a secret subgroup of the Magi that passed it on for, five, for 500 years. And these guys are the guys that follow the star to Bethlehem. And there's circumstances around that you need to understand. The Parthian Empire was the rival to Rome. And you need to understand that and who they were to really understand why Herod was so nervous when they arrived and why he was so deferent to them. There's a whole background there, but ultimately these Magi would... Uh, followed a prophecy that would lead them to a manger in Bethlehem. And we'll deal with that, of course, when we get to Matthew chapter 2. Well, that, we've gone through half the book of Daniel. The, the, the last half are prophecies. There are the four beasts of Daniel 7, Ram and Hego to Daniel 8, the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, and uh, the dark side of the spiritual warfare thing in Daniel 10, and the climax of the book in Daniel 11 and 12. It's the final consummation of all things. Times of the Gentiles. We, we went through, bear in mind, we're looking at history through the lens of Israel, but, but here in this particular segment of the Bible, it's sort of an exception. We're going to see all of Gentile history in overview. 
And it's interesting, there's only four empires involved, not seven or three or whatever, four. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Those four. The fifth one will be God actually setting up His own kingdom on the planet Earth. And uh, so, and that fourth empire will be in two phases, and we'll get into that. We went through Daniel chapter 2, the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, and so forth, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel himself is treated to a series of visions. Daniel 2 was given to a man, and we see these empires as man would see them, bright, shiny metals. Daniel is given a vision of how they look to God, and the subject is the same, but the view is quite different. God sees them as a series of voracious beasts. The first is likened to a winged lion, and he's followed by a bear that rises up, by, up on one side. And uh, there's another one that's sort of like a winged leopard that moves so fast it doesn't even touch the ground. And then there's the last one, Daniel can't find an animal to even liken it to. He calls it the great and terrible beast, and it goes into a phase with ten heads and so on. And we'll recognize the ten toes on the one hand, the ten heads on the other. We're going to realize these things to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And the, of course, the winged lion was a symbol of Babylon. The bear on one side uh, is a, uh, raises up on one side. The, the Persians and the Mede, it was a coalition in which the Persians were end up, end up being dominant. And of course, the Greek Empire was uh, uh, characterized by its rapidity. Alexander, in 12 years, conquers the world. Just a few years. At age of 29, he falls on his bed crying, there's no other world, worlds left to conquer. And so, but Rome, of course, emerges in roughly 68 B.C. And uh, bat, at the Battle of Actium is when Octavius uh, de, de, you know, defeats Mark Anthony and becomes Caesar Augustus, if you will. And you finally get down to about 284 A.D. when Diocletian divides the empire. By then it's grown so big, he divides it into the two legs. In 312 A.D., Constantine takes over. He's so fed up with the politics in Rome, he moves the capital of the world to Byzantium. Calls it Constantinople, the new Rome. And uh, it and endures till uh, the, the end of the 15th century, when the Islam Muslims finally run it over. In 476, the Western Empire, of course, breaks into pieces, and e every element's had its, had its day in the sun. But let's go to Daniel 8, the ram and the he-goat. Oh, and by the way, Daniel 7 describes the final empire as, uh, 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 as when, God, when Christ takes over the world. And it, it goes into all that. Daniel 8 ta is, a, is a detail now on the, the, the Persians and the Greeks. This is about two years after the vision of Daniel chapter 7. It's about 12 years before Daniel chapter 5 when Babylon falls, just to give you a rough feeling where this fits in chronologically. And uh, uh, the ram is defeated by the goat there's a rapid goat coming from the west. It's clearly, it's, 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 it's a very vivid description of Alexander's conquest of the Persians. And uh, this notable horn, namely da Alexander himself, uh, is killed and, he, and uh, four generals divide up the empire. And there's a little horn that has a key role at the end. That's going to be important later. And da Daniel interprets this for us. A leader from the west, obviously Alexander the Great, will subdue the Medo-Persian Empire. Alexander the Great crosses the Hellespont with 35,000 troops, and he's fighting a powerful army in the hundreds of thousands. And he, in, in a series of three battles, takes wins, takes them on. He was a genius, an incredible general, and he would be out there leading his troops. And he turned several of those battles from defeat to victory by his personal involvement absolutely legendary series of, of uh, events that are well documented and there's obviously a lot of popular movies coming out about it and so forth. And so the one-horned goat was the symbol of the ancient Macedonians. Uh, in uh, in uh, Aries the ram is the symbol of Persia. Capricorn the symbol of Greece. And in May 30, 334 he crossed the Hellespont with 35,000 troops and first met, defeated the Persians at the Granicus River. And then the, uh, a year later he finds himself... Uh, uh, at the Battle of Isis, and uh, wins that one. And uh, the, the final big one was Gagamela, October 331 B.C., which establishes the Greek Empire as the dominant guys of the block here. When Alexander dies shortly thereafter, he makes Babylon his capital, he finally dies. He goes all, he, by the way, he conquers all the way to India. And uh, Cassander takes the uh, western part, the four generals divided up, 
Lysimachus uh, takes uh, Thrace, Bithynia, and most of Asia Minor, what, Asia Minor being what we think of as Turkey. Um, Ptolemy uh, takes the south, Egypt, Cyrene, and part of, of, of Arabia. And Seleucus takes the east, Syria, and lands to the east, all the way to India, but much of that's hard to hang on to. And uh, in this era, uh, Seleucus, there's going to be a guy arise we're going to talk about more in the next session, Antiochus Epiphanes. He's a, he's a particular leader. He's not very important from a secular point of view. He's extremely important from a biblical point of view, and we'll get into that. But I want to focus uh, uh, very specifically on what's the most astonishing passage in the entire Bible. It's the one that impacted my life as a teenager and has ne never ceased to. In those days, the materials that ha I, I was uh, treated to by some friends were very rare, and it was an unusual situation. Today, the materials we're dealing with are, are readily available in any any competent uh, book source. Uh, so you can check this all out. It's uh, absolutely astonishing. Daniel chapter 9. A little bit of background you want to, as we go into this, you want to understand the history of the English Bible a little bit. The original Hebrew is sometimes called by scholars the Vorlaga, but in 285 BC, before Christ, uh, it was translated into Greek. In those days, Greek was being enforced as a language worldwide because of the influence of Alexander and his successors. Um, if you were Jewish, you probably didn't know Hebrew except for ceremonial purposes, much as a, a Catholic knows Latin. It wasn't a common language to you. If you were Greek, if you were a, a, a Jew that was living in that world, you spoke Greek, you had a desire to have your scriptures in your natural language, Greek. Well, under Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus in Alexandria, the primary literary capital of the world in that time, um, he funded the translation of the Old Testament, the, t the Hebrew Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, into, uh, into Greek. It took 15 years. And uh, we call the result of that work the Septuagint. It involved 70 scholars, some say 72 scholars, um, the best they could find to do the translation. And so they call that translation the Septuagint, fancy word for 70. It's usually abbreviated in Roman numeral 70, LXX. But the point is, we have that work product. The Old Testament, as it existed three centuries before the ministry period of the New Testament, uh, it's, it's in our hands. It, it was in, Daniel was in black and white. I want to emphasize that because you can set aside who wrote what book when, doesn't matter. It was in black and white three centuries before the Gospel period. In fact, it's the Septuagint that becomes the Christian's Bible. Most of the quotes in the New Testament that are taken from the Old Testament are from the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew. So it's the Septuagint they're quoting from, interestingly enough. And so I want you to be conscious of the fact that we've got 300 year anticipation of the New Testament here. Now when four disciples come to Jesus for a confidential briefing on a second coming, He gives them a two chapter answer in Matthew. It's also recounted in Mark 13 and Luke 21. And in that, Jesus identifies the key event of end time prophecy. He points them to the passage we're going to look at. He says to the disciples, when ye therefore shall see... He, fir he first of all lists, lists a bunch of things that are not signs. This, that, and the other thing will happen, but the end is not yet. But then he gets to verse 15 of Matthew 24. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, who so readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, and, and you split, and you split now. He goes on for several verses to explain that. We'll, go at, we'll look at that later. But how many of you read that on the screen? Have you seen that passage? I did a dirty trick on you. Because if you read that, you know, there's, a, there's a part of this is written to you. It says, Whoso readeth, let him understand. You're, we're going to discover this is, gets a little technical, but it's clearly the intent of Jesus Christ that his reader understand what he's pointing to here. You with me? And uh, we'll talk about the abomination of des desolation later, but I want you to notice this spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Jesus Christ authenticates Daniel that he was a prophet, and he specifically points to the verses we're going to be looking at as the key to the, to the end times. And so let's just take a look at this. Daniel, Daniel 9 is the chapter with the interrupted prayer. And uh, first 19 verses. He's reading from the book of Jeremiah, and he's reading where Jeremiah predicts that the captivity would be for 70 years. And he knows that the 70 years are almost over. So what does Daniel do about it? He goes to prayer. See, we're supposed to do the same thing. Most of when we get excited about the end time, boy, Jesus coming soon, what do we do about it? 
What we're supposed to do is pray for it. That's what's in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. That's a prayer. Prayer is God's way of enlisting you in what He's doing. Well, that's exactly Daniel sets that example, and he goes in this prayer. And when he, it's frustrating that we can't take the time to get into the prayer, but even in the English translation, as you read it, we, by the time you get to verse 18 and 19, you can feel Daniel tremble. As you read it, you'll see the frequency of the verb start picking up. You can just feel he's getting into a frenzy, and his prayer is interrupted by the arrival of a most unusual visitor. Gabriel comes to see him. We have two archangels that are super angels that are, have names and we know their job descriptions, Michael and, a- and Gabriel. Michael is always a military commander on behalf of Israel. Gabriel is always an annunciator, always announcing something having to do with the Messiah, whether it's to Daniel here or to Mary and Luke, whichever. So Gabriel visits from verse 20 to 23. And he gives Daniel four verses that are, turn out to be the most astonishing verses in the Bible. They're, they're known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. From verse 24 through the end of the chapter, verse 27, four verses. 70 weeks of Daniel. Now there's 70 Shibuim. I'll come back to that in a minute. The first of the four verses is the scope. The second of the four verses is 69 weeks. The 69 weeks. Then we encounter an interval and then the 70th week. Now this sounds pretty simple, but it's very important to understand that verse 25 encompasses 20, uh, 69 of the total weeks. Verse 27 encompasses the last, final, missing week. Verse 26 talks about things after verse 25, but before verse 27. Th- thus we infer the weeks are not contiguous. There's a gap. There's an interval. So once you understand that, it all flows and makes sense. The first of the four is verse 24, the scope. Seventy sevens are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city. Seventy sevens, seventy shibuim, is what it, seventy sevens is what it's really saying. If I told you I've got to leave, I'll be back in a decade, when would you expect me? Ten years, exactly. See, I didn't say years, I just said a decade. In Hebrew, they have a week of days, we're obviously familiar with that. There's a week of weeks, that's what Shavuot is all about. There's a week of months, that's the, from uh, Nisan to Tishri, or Tishri to Nisan, either way, is, is, is uh, seven, uh, seven months. And they also have a sabbatical year, seven years. Six years you can plow the land, the seventh year you're supposed to leave it uh, rest. So there's a rest for the land also. So in the Jewish mind, there's, se- the seven, there's all kinds of sevens. But a, a week of years is a very common unit of measure. When Jacob... Uh, uh, um, labored for his wives. He, labeled, he, he labored for seven years, for one and seven years to the next one. He had to fulfill her week, is the expression in Genesis. And so on it goes. Well, anyway, so these are obviously weeks of years. Seventy sevens, seventy weeks of years, are determined upon whom? Get this, it's very important to know this right away. Upon thy people in the holy city. This has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with, it's Jewish. Daniel was Jewish. Upon thy people and upon thy holy city. It's on, it's on the Jews in Jerusalem. It says, Seventy sevens are determined, or reckoned, upon thy people and upon the holy city, to do six things. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, we could spend some time going through each one of these, but uh, 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 it's pretty obvious that at least uh, as a group, they are not complete yet. Have we made an end of sins? Not so you'd notice. Have we finished transgressing? Pick up the daily paper anytime. Yeah, have we brought, brought in everlasting righteousness? And so on. So the point is, this, when this happens, when this is finally, when the 77s are completed, that's all she wrote. There's a real sense of completion here. Are you with me? So it isn't complete yet. So the next verse, verse 25, deals with 69 of those weeks, and this is the one I want to focus on. Know therefore, Gabriel says to Daniel, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Daniel is in in Babylon, Jerusalem is in rubble a couple hundred miles to the west. But he knows that Jerusalem is, they're going to, the captivity is about over, it has a destiny to be rebuilt. Gabriel drops in and says, by the way, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah the King. 
shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troubled times. Now I want you to notice, from unto. There are milestones. It's a, the trigger, the beginning, is a commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Don't confuse that with the temple. The city is in view here, and I'll prove that to you in a minute. Unto the Mashiach Nagid, the word Nagid is first used of Saul, it's, it's Messiah the king, shall be seven plus, uh, plus sixty-two, three score and two. And the, notice the, the Holy Spirit adds something here, the street shall be built again and the wall, even troubled times. Why did the Holy Spirit put that in there? So you wouldn't get confused because it will be preceded by some decrees to rebuild the temple. The issue here is not the temple, it's the city of Jerusalem. The, the 77th are determined upon thy people and the holy city, right? Okay. Now, so we have a mathematical prophecy. From the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the King shall be 69 weeks. It turns out we're indebted to Sir Robert Anderson, the head of Scotland Yard, he, his landmark study of 1894 where he recognized that in the Bible, for God's own reasons, he uh, deals in 360 day years. He does that in Genesis, he does that in Revelation. And there's a whole thing behind that we can get into. Uh, we do it when you study Joshua and, and the, the orbits of Mars and all that business, but I won't get into that here. We know that the biblical usage is 360 day years, and we indebted to Robert Anderson for unraveling this whole thing by recognizing that particular thing. So 69 times 7 times 360 turns out to be 173,880 days. And you don't have to remember that number, we'll get to that in a minute, but... Um, they say there's, some of your Bible studies say there are four decrees to rebuild Jerusalem. Cyrus in 537, Darius, Artaxerxes 458, another one by Artaxerxes in 445, and these are all referred to in your Bible, by the way. But um, in, this, in verse 25, it spoke of Rechab, the street, and the wall, or the moat. And uh, those are Hebrew words. They have nothing to do with the temple, they have to do with the city. It turns out that it's the city, not the temple, that's in view in Daniel's prophecy. So these first three are having to do with the temple, not with the city. We're interested in the one by Artaxerxes Longimanus in 445 B.C. So we know where that decree is. We know that from records that that was Mar on our calendar would be March 14th to 445 B.C. The problem is, okay, great, when did Jesus allow Himself to be presented as a king? Several times in the Gospel period. They tried to take him as a king, and he says, mine hour has not yet come. He slips away, in John 6 and some other places. Then one day, Jesus does something very bizarre. He not only permits it, he arranges it, to deliberately fulfill Zechariah 9.9. In Zechariah, the prophet said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, right upon an ass. In fact, a colt, the foal of an ass. The ki thy king cometh unto thee. How will be recognized? Riding this donkey. And of course, we recognize that right away, that uh, uh, as we look in Luke 19, when he's riding the donkey from Bethany up over the Mount of Olives, down through the Kedon Valley, Jerusalem, and as, they, as he does so, they lay down their palm branches and the coats, and they sing Psalm 118. In Luke 19, verse 38, it says, They are singing, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. How many of you have heard the thing, This is the day the Lord hath made, we shall rejoice and be glad in it? Sure, we've all heard that. And we apply it to any day, and that's okay, but that's not what it's about. That's Psalm 118, verse 26. And the reason is, it's talking about the day the Messiah presents himself. They're singing this song under these conditions. Now, anytime you and I, as Gentiles, not having a good Jewish background, run the danger of missing something, the Pharisees come to our rescue. Anytime they get unglued, pay attention. The Holy Spirit's trying to tell us something. Because in the next verse, it says, Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, that is the Messiah, said, Master, rebuke thy disciples. What are they upset about? Because they recognize that by singing this psalm under these conditions, they're declaring him the Mashiach Nagid. And they assume he certainly doesn't want them to blaspheme. You follow you get the picture? You see why they're upset? He's, he, he, they're, de they're declaring this guy the Messiah. The next verse, Jesus responds to them very tactfully. <laughs> he, said, he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And I'm one of these 
cynics, I wish they would have shut up for a minute to see if that is just a figure of speech. <laughs> and I always tell our people when we're on a tour, we go to, almost every year, we go to Israel. And what, what, like most tour groups, we will be up on the Mount of Olives because it's a great picture outlook over Jerusalem, over the Kidron Valley. And the next stop is usually Gethsemane, which is the base of the Mount of Olives. The buses will drop you up there for your pictures, but then let you walk down that road to Gethsemane, which is usually your next stop for a devotional before going on wherever. We'll always tell the group before they get off the bus, take your pictures, but then you have an opportunity to get the best bargain in Israel. Uh, as you walk down that road to Gethsemane, pick up a couple of stones, put it in your pocket. And when you get home, mount them on a piece of wood for your den or your desk at the office or wherever, and... Uh, uh, as a little, uh, as a trophy. And when somebody is visiting, says, what's that? You say, that's one of the stones that didn't cry out. <laughs> and you've got to go, you got to explain Daniel 9, you get into Luke 19, <laughs> and they brought it up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the chronology of Christ's ministry should understand, uh, ministry began in the fall of 28 A.D. How do we know that? Tiberius was appointed in 14 A.D. That means, uh, see, Augustus died in uh, 19, uh, August 19th of 14 A.D. And we know from Luke uh, 3, verse 1, that it was within the 15th year of Tiberius. To be in the 15th year, there's 14 behind him. So that's year 28 on, on reckoning. You follow me? And uh, we know that the crucifixion occurred incident to the fourth Passover, which would have been April 6th of 32, 8, 32 AD. And so Robert Anderson obviously nails all this down. There are other chronologies held by good scholars, but most of them are contrived in order to support a Friday crucifixion. And there's a lot of reasons. There's about at least three reasons from the Scripture that he could not have been crucified on Friday. I won't get, get into all that here. We'll get into that later. But um, so the point is, we know the trigger, the terminus ad quo, as they call it, the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus, March 14th of 440, 445 B.C. And we know the triumphal entry was on April 6th of 32 A.D. What's interesting about this is the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament occurs roughly a third of the way there from between the two. And uh, in other words, 300 years earlier, is the translation is in black and white. So this is not contrived by some ri rabbis. This was in black and white before it happened. Well, from 445 B.C. to 32 A.D. is 173,740 days if you go through the arithmetic. From March 14th to April 6th, another 24 days. And if you go through the leap year calculations, there's another 116 days to deal with. It turns out that adds up to guess what? 173,880 days. What was Gabriel's margin of error? Five centuries in advance, he predicts the exact day that Jesus Christ presents himself as the Mashiach Nagid to Jerusalem. When you think that through, that is staggering proof of just who Jesus Christ is. He is the Messiah of Israel. If you want a Messiah of Israel, it has to be somebody that was killed before this date and, 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 con and conforms to all the other specifications. The crucifixion of Christ was not a tragedy, it was an achievement. Fulfilling specifications that were laid down as early as Eden and following. But we're not, not through. In Luke 19, Jesus, is, he, as He's coming up over the hill on the donkey, when He's come near, it says, He beheld the city, and what did He do? He wept over it. And notice what He says carefully. Wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. He expected them to know this day. And because they didn't know it, they are now blinded. Forever no. Paul will tell us they're blinded only until Romans 11.25. Until the fullest of the Gentiles be come in. This thy day, but now they're hidden from thine eyes. But then he goes on, he says, But for the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. And indeed, the Roman legions, the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions, 38 years later, it's very interesting that when Israel failed to take charge of the land at Kadesh Barnea, they, had, they were destined to wander in the land for 38 years. We say 40 in round figures, but it was 38 years. It's interesting that because they didn't recognize their Messiah, 38 years later, the Roman legions lay siege, slaughter over a million inhabitants, men, women, and children. Another half million died due to the pestilence that followed. Why was Jerusalem destroyed in 70 A.D.? The biggest, one of the biggest milestones in the Jewish calendar. Why was Jerusalem destroyed in 70 A.D.? 
There are a lot of good answers to that. Let's look at Jesus' answer. The rest of that verse. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You know, that's chilling. Jesus held them accountable. I personally believe He'll hold us accountable too. We've had a lot more light than they did, and I think He holds us accountable too. They knew it's not the time of the visitation. The next verse talks about the interval. After three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, karat, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end thereof shall be with a flood, and to, unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Karat, to be executed for a capital crime. The Messiah is going to be killed. Yes, it says so in the Old Testament. Daniel so it says so in several places. Daniel 9.26, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, etc. It also introduces another character, the prince that shall come. We know who the people were that destroyed the city and sanctuary, but here it describes the people of the prince that shall come. The prince that shall come is one of 33 titles in the Old Testament of a coming world leader. We tend to call him the Antichrist. Who are the people of the prince that shall come? The Romans. That's why we think the prince is a Roman. That doesn't mean he's from Western Europe. We have other evidence to indicate that he's an Assyrian from the Roman Empire as it's extended in the old days. So we have this interval during which the crucifixion takes place. It takes place four days after the event of the, the donkey. The temple is destroyed. More than 38 years, we've got 2,000 that we've experienced before the seventh, this last final week. So the interval, this interval, by the way, is implied in 24 different verses throughout the Bible. The 24 is a very interesting number because it's also a symbol of the church from Revelation. The interval is defined, as I mentioned, from verse Luke 19.42 to Romans 11.25. And uh, it's the period of the church. That's an era that's kept secret in the Old Testament pretty much, that Paul explains in Ephesians 3. The church was born at Pentecost, and uh, it, it, uh, there are prerequisites for the church. The atonement, the resurrection, and the ascension all had to precede it. Spiritual gifts are only given after the ascension. So there's a whole ecclesiological, a study in ecclesiology that's necessary here. But let's move on. The last verse of Daniel 9, and he, that is the prince that shall come, if it's the pronoun always refers to the last mentioned antecedent, which was of course the prince that shall come, shall enforce the covenant with the many, it's an idiom for Israel, for one week, the final week. And in the midst of that week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That causes to infer that somehow the covenant that he's enforcing allowed them to indulge in their sacrifice and oblations. So we know the temple's standing by the time you get to the middle of the week. We don't know when the temple's built. It could be built during the first half of that week of years or even earlier, who knows. But he desecrates it here. He causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Paul details this for you in 2 Thessalonians 2 and elsewhere. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And so ends Daniel 9. In this verse we find time, times, and half a time. We find that in, in Daniel 7.25, Daniel 12.7, Revelation 12.14. So half, the half weeks are called three and a half years some places, 42 months other places, 1260 days. The Holy Spirit's done everything. It's the most documented period of time in the Old Testament and the most documented period of time in the New Testament. This strange uh, two half, uh, half weeks of years. And uh, so... In fact, every detail in the Scriptures by design, when you get to John 10, right in the middle of John 10, the, the, whole, the, uh, the Jesus is giving us the Good Shepherd discourse. But right in the middle it says it was Jerusalem at the Feast of Dedication and it was winter. And if you're a normal, you know, uh, normal human being, you go on and read on. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you're no longer a normal, well-adjusted human being. Yeah. You know that everything that is there is there deliberately. Why did the Holy Spirit want you to know that it was in Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter? Well, what, when, what dedication could that be? Solomon's temple was dedicated in the fall, according to 1 Kings 8. The second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, was dedicated in the spring, according to Ezra 6. What temple occurred in the winter? The rededication of the temple on the 25th of Kislev, when anti celebrating the rededication subsequent to Antiochus Epiphanes desecrating it. That happened two centuries before Jesus made the remark, and we're going to talk about that. There's a very peculiar event called the Abomination of Desolation that we'll talk more about in the next session. It ushers in a period of time, a time of trouble as the world has never seen to that time or ever would see again. And Jesus himself labels it the Great Tribulation by quoting from Daniel 12. And the two halves of that week, as I say, are documented many, many times over. 
And uh, Jesus says that for the, the, in, in the discussion with the disciples, there shall be great tribulations such as not since the beginning of the world this time, nor ever it shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for your elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. He's quoting from Daniel 12. We haven't gotten there yet, but it says, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And Jesus says in another place, in Hosea, He says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me earnestly. In order for Him to return, He must have left His place, right? So even though it's, that's in Hosea, the last verse of chapter 5, it's obviously referring to the return of Jesus Christ. And of course, at the end of the week, of course, we have the second coming, and uh, we have the gathering of the church, and there's three, a number of different views. Some feel that the gathering of the church is at the end of the seven years. Some feel it's in the middle. Some a little later than the middle. Uh, we hold the view ourselves that it's before the 70 week even starts. In fact, by a short distance ahead probably. There are good scholars supporting each one of these and we will discuss the pros and cons of each one of these later in the study. But we do know that 69 weeks are behind us. The 70th week we believe for lots of indica indicators are, are, are not far away. So it's an exciting time. You might be interested to know that the, the, the 490 years that are represented by the 70 weeks is the fourth such period in Israel's history. Because if you take the period from Abraham to the Exodus and subtract out the years that they were in disfavor, uh, it was 505 years uh, from uh, the, on the one hand, but just take out the 15 years that you, it was Ish Ishmael was a usurper in effect, you have 490 years. If you go from Exodus to the Temple, it's 601 years, but if you subtract out the servitudes of the judges, which are 111 years, you again get this interesting number of 490 years. You go from the temple to the edict of Artaxerxes, you again have 560 years, but you subtract the seven years of the Babylonian captivity, you have again 490 years. And of course, from Artaxerxes to the first advent, of the 69 weeks plus the 70th week, we don't know the interval. The interval Israel is set aside for the moment. So this is, I think, first it was first noticed by Clarence Larkin back in 1919, but it's it's an interesting possibility I shared before you. Daniel 10 will give us a glimpse of the dark side, a very brief episode here. It's a prelude to the final two chapters of the book. Daniel fasts for 21 days. An angel is sent. When he gets there, he points out he was withstood for 21 days by a creature called the Prince of the Kingdom of Persia, one of Satan's hosts. And he can't get through until Michael comes and helps him. When assisted by Michael, the chief prince, and he's explaining to Daniel, he's going to give him a subsequent vision. That'll be Daniel, the last two verses, last two chapters of Daniel, Daniel 11 and 12. And he'll ha then he'll have to go back and deal with that, the prince of Persia, and then he'll also have to deal with the prince of the power of Greece. This is just a glimpse, but we get the impression here that there are demonic hosts behind each of the major world empires. After all, it is Satan's world, isn't it? But you can't help, it doesn't say this, but you can't help but wonder, is there a linkage between Daniel's fast and his ability to get through? Daniel fasts for 21 days. He was set when Daniel started, and he gets through after the 21 days to give him these visions that are coming. Um, you sort of wonder, what would have happened if Daniel had stopped his fast after 19 days? Does there, is there anything, is there a link between them? We don't know. It's suggested, isn't it? Of course, anyway, the empire gets divided uh, in chapter 11, and we have the detail, as I mentioned to you before, of the period between the Testaments. And I won't take you through these, but there's a half a dozen Tol Ptolemaic dynasties that fight with uh, half a dozen uh, Antiochus dynasties. And they're so deep, the first verses 5 to 35 are so detailed that the experts have had to try to say that Daniel must have been late dated. And uh, it was in Ptolemy, Philadelphia, by the way, that the Septuagint was translated and so on. But um, so the detailed profile is there, and it also includes the last few verses give us a detailed background on this coming world leader, which we'll be taking up in a subsequent session. But the Bible has over 8,000 predictive verses on almost 2,000 predictions on over 700 different matters, according to one categorization by J. Parton Baines in the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. In other words, the Bible is largely prophetic. And as we look around the world today, we see major themes in Israel, Jerusalem, the Temple, Babylon, Russia, the rise of China, Europe, the emergence of a European superstate. While all this is going on, a tide towards ecumenical religion. Let's all get together. A global government tide on the horizon. And of course, the rise of the occult. Each one of these is predicted in the scripture. Each one of these is measurably emerging on the horizon. It's not one of them. It's not some one little thing. It's all of them. The tide of each one of them 
is clearly setting the stage for the big climax coming. Check it out. And the more you know about your Bible, and the more you know about what's going on in the world, the more you'll begin to see that we are converging to the big climax. And the ultimate issue, of course, is that you and I are in possession of a extraterrestrial message. And it portrays us as both the pawns and the prize of an unseen warfare. And our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the ultimate victor in this cosmic conflict. Where do you stand with respect to him? Now in the next session we'll talk about the decree of Cyrus. That's a very colorful thing. It'll blow you away. And we'll talk about Ezra, the rebuilding of the temple, and the book of Nehemiah, which focuses on the building of Jerusalem. And we'll talk about one of the most colorful dramas in the Bible, the book of Esther. It'll, ha it'll have some, it's, it's quite a drama, very colorful. It also, hidden underneath the text are some surprises that we'll share with you. And then we'll talk a little bit about the intertestament period in the next session. Stay with us.